Hello again. Thanks for that quick transition from the various rooms and conversations. And sorry that we rushed uh, a few of those conversations, but they're going to continue. Um, so my job here, again, I'm Max. I'm with Data for Black Lives. Um, um, and I'm here to introduce um, our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Ron Sullivan. And Ron Sullivan is actually one of the people who I think I met for the first time today, but I've been following his work for a long time on Twitter. And he actually accepted the invitation to speak here um, through a Twitter DM. So that's, <laughs> if that's not data for black lives, I don't know what is. Um, so Ron Sullivan is a law professor at Harvard Law, where he focuses a lot of his work in the areas of criminal law, criminal procedure, and race theory. He's a faculty director of the Harvard Criminal Justice Institute and the Harvard Trial Advocacy Workshop. Prior to Harvard, he served on the faculty of Yale Law, where he won the Law School's Award for Outstanding Teaching after his first year. Ron has been fighting the good fight for a long while, but I wanted to focus on two specific sort of fights. Um, one in 2007, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, Professor Sullivan was asked to sort of create a system um, and, and help solve a crisis where over 6,000 citizens were incarcerated in and around New Orleans without representation. And a lot of their official records were sort of destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. And Professor Sullivan, um, and I'm sure he'll talk about this today, sort of designed a defense delivery system that resulted in the release of nearly all the 6,000 inmates. And in 2014, similar work, um, he was tasked to design and implement a conviction review unit for the newly elected uh, Brooklyn District Attorney. And this same system helped identify and exonerate wrongfully convicted persons. And has been sort of a model for a lot of conviction uh, integrity programs in the nation. And a recent article described him as an unsung hero in our midst, the man who dealt one of the biggest blows to mass incarceration. And in that, it says, quote, at a time when alternative facts rule the day and the landmark achievements of the civil rights movement and democracy itself are on life support, it's important for those of us in the know and in the struggle to share stories of local victories and profiles and courage to fuel our hope for a better tomorrow. Um, please welcome Ron Sullivan. All right, so that's, that's how you make an entrance. <laughs> and you know, the stage manager told me, so we put white tape there because it's dark, and you're going to need to see where the stairs are. Uh, of course, I did not, uh, but uh, that was not for lack of planning. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here. I've, uh, I had a wonderful yesterday. And um, I want to give a special thanks first to uh, Max for the uh, kind introduction, for the uh, organizers and the staff of this incredible uh, conference. Uh, my brain was on overload uh, yesterday as I was listening and the sorts of ideas and the sorts of projects that uh, I can envision now are just uh, too numerous to even ar articulate. But um, thank you all for, um, for having invited me. Um, I have a nearly impossible schedule, and uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Lucas as well uh, personally for uh, putting up with it and being aggressive in getting in touch with me and, and, and coming out to the office. Uh, but it is, uh, I am so, so glad and, and so uh, happy to be here. Um, I want to tell you a little bit <clears throat> about uh, what got me interested in the sort of work that I've done the last several years and how uh, data science might be helpful in those endeavors. So um, I, as, as of years ago, as a very young scholar, uh, I started working on mitochondrial DNA and its use in evidence. So um, Mitochondrial DNA is different from the sort of DNA that we normally think about. It's the stuff you can find in bones and hair. It's, it's, uh, it's robust. It lasts. And prosecutors all over the country started using mitochondrial DNA uh, in order to make identifications. Right? 
problem is, that's not what mitochondrial DNA does. Mitochondrial DNA shows that there is a matrilineal lineage, a lineage or relationship, but it doesn't point to a particular person in the way that nuclear DNA, and that's the normal sort of DNA that we think of. So I went on this crusade around the country to try to educate judges on how to talk about mitochondrial DNA to jurors. Now, so it's funny how things happen. So I left that, moved on to um, op the complete opposite end of the spectrum and started doing work in moral philosophy. And then, <laughs> so completely opposite end of the spectrum, right? So then um, we started getting all these DNA exoneration cases. And I started getting interested in DNA again because it seemed to me for the first time science started making people already not disposed to believe that innocent people were incarcerated to begin to believe it because in accord with their thinking, well, DNA doesn't lie. So you had all these DNA exonerations. So for the first time, uh, people to the right of Attila the Hun began to think that, well, geez, we might have innocent people in jail, right? Now, I started my career as a public defender, the DC Public Defender Service in the District of Columbia. Have you got a PDSer out there? All right, all right. It is, uh, it's a wonderful PDS family, so we have, we have, to, we have to talk uh, after this. I started my career there, and one of the things that I was absolutely certain of, and the data later bore this out, is that cases where there is DNA evidence represent a minor fraction. It's the minor fraction of the cases. Right? We're talking about in the single digit percentages. So I have this hypothesis, right? I said, well, if we see these sorts of mistakes in DNA cases, what are we going to see in all these other cases? Yeah. You know, if DNA cases represent, say, 2% of the cases out there. What's going on with the other 98%? Right. So at a minimum, I thought we would see the same error rate in non-DNA cases than we did in DNA cases. Right? My gut told me it's going to be much higher. Why? Because DNA cases are the ones that receive all the resources. That's where you get the best lawyers and you know the DNA testing and all, you know, everybody's focused and paying attention. What about all these other cases where nobody's looking? What happens to those? So I thought, geez, there's got to be a lot of cases out there. So <clears throat> my team and I at Harvard looked at every DNA exoneration case in the country. Right? And why didn't I know about these guys then? Because we did it by hand. <laughs> right? Every DNA exoneration in the country uh, to figure out what happened. Why do, how do we make this mistake? And it turned out that we were able to chart uh, some of the common, most common reasons for error. And I'll give you just a couple of them. One is single witness identification cases. So single witness identification cases are extraordinarily prone for error. It doesn't mean the defendant is innocent. What does it mean? It means we ought to take a close look because these are the sorts of cases that result in error, right? Cross-racial single identification cases, off the charts, completely off the charts. And it turns out for very good reasons. I'll put a small parenthesis here, right? Some, there, we, we, did a, we did some work with uh, some people in the psychology department and the, and the Harvard Medical School to look at this issue of cross-racial identification. It turns out if from zero to three, you are not around people of different races, you don't develop the subconscious tools to differentiate between people, right? So now I grew up, and my mother used to always say, well, they, they say you, they can't tell, people say they can't tell any black people apart, and that's terribly racist, right? So I, I grew up in Gary, Indiana, just about overwhel overwhelmingly black, almost all black, then went to Morehouse College, so the... Uh, all right, all right, all right. A lot of connections here. PDS, Spelman, Morehouse, all right. Uh, Tuskegee, all right. <laughs> the, 
<laughs> we're we're going to have a party today. This is, this is going to be fun. The, um, uh, and so the first time I ever sat in a classroom with a, a non-African-American person was at Harvard Law School. And, um, and I know I seem way too young for that. It's just a, it's an accident of history where I grew up and then and, and where I went to school. Um, and I found I couldn't tell anybody apart when I got there, <laughs> right? And I said, oh, well, maybe it's not, it's not racist after all. Um, I just don't have experience with this sort of thing, right? And I learned it uh, sort of the, the, the hard way. Like someone would say, oh, so-and-so, the one with the green eyes. And I'm thinking, how in the world would I know what color somebody's eyes are, right? And it turns out because where I grew up, everyone basically had the same color eyes. I looked at different markers for distinctions. And it was deeply embedded into my subconscious, right? You know, in my vocabulary, my subconscious vocabulary, it's, it's somebody light skin or dark skin, length of hair. Hair color is about the same for the most part, right? And so it works out that way. Perceptive narrowing is, is one of the terms that, that, that they use to describe it. Cross-racial identification, horribly prone to error. Honest, genuine mistakes many times. Another, juvenile confessions without a parent present. Extraordinarily error prone. Right. So I was doing this work and um, you know, I, I had this professor in college who used to always talk about the eternal zeitgeist, right? That it would just sweep over this eternal zeitgeist. And I had one of these zeitgeist moments. It's an old German philosophical word that means world spirit that just sweeps over, right? So I'm sitting here doing this, this academic research. My telephone rings. And it's a representative from the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. And she says, well, what? Um, you know, we, I, I know this work you're doing. There's this new DA here who's really serious about conviction review. You know, would you consider coming to Brooklyn and designing a program to look at our past convictions? And I said, well, uh, that's an interesting call. You do realize this is, uh, you're talking to Ronald Sullivan. Because I've been a defense guy all of my life. I started as a public defender, and I was like, dear God, if you Google any of my writing, I've, I've, I'm not particularly kind to prosecutors. Are you sure that you want, uh, <laughs> you want me and uh, she says, absolutely, I, I, think you're, I, I think you're perfect for it. Uh, can you think about it? I said, sure. So my team and I, we switch gears. We look at every conviction review unit in the country. Uh, we look at their successes, their failures, what makes them work, uh, what makes them tick, uh, why some fail, why some are better than each other. I, I have a series of conversations with the uh, uh, District Attorney Ken Thompson, um, the late Kim Tom Ken Thompson, who um, regrettably died uh, quite unexpectedly, uh, early 50s, uh, uh, extraordinarily tragic. But uh, I had a conversation with Ken, and I said, okay, uh, I'll do it. So uh, I began commuting from Cambridge to Brooklyn and designed this program. And I'll talk about the design of the program. Um, and it had three components. So and Ken said, look, um, you can have anything you want. Give me the gold standard, the best program in the country. And I was like, anything? He said, anything. I said, all right, let, let, let's do that. Uh, we ended up creating the second biggest bureau in that district attorney's office. It's the third largest in the country. Ten full-time prosecutors, two police officers, and two paralegals devoted to nothing but looking at past convictions and attempting to correct errors. Real commitment, real commitment that he made. He went to the city council and got a million dollars extra to be able to fund this, right? And I, I just want to pause here because, and you, you know, you saw one yesterday. Um, I went down to, to Chicago and visited with Kim Fox when she was elected, and we talked about the model and uh, another committed prox prosecutor. Right. And I'll pause here because that's not common. Right. If you think about it, you know, no prosecutor gets elected by saying, ladies and gentlemen, if you vote for me, I will get people out of jail. <laughs> right? 
That's not, that, that's not the vocabulary that, uh, that we use in this country. We are tough on crime. Right? That's the political, political economy that tends to grab voters. So it takes a special prosecutor to stand up and say, I'm going to do something just a little differently. Right? So the program design had three elements, three important elements. The first was that within that unit, there had to be a non-adversarial norm. Non-adversarial norm. What does that mean? So <clears throat> I'm a lawyer. If there are any other lawyers out there, um, and citizens as well, you know that we live in what's called an adversary legal system. One person has a point on this side. Another person has a point on this side. And they vigorously argue those points to a neutral arbiter who decides which is the better argument. That's our system. That's how we grew up in the system. So we said, that has to stop. That has to stop. We are moving to a non-adversarial system in here where defense attorneys and prosecutors share information in a joint effort to get to the truth. That's the starting point. That's the starting point. Because this isn't about winning or losing. This is about figuring out whether someone is illegally and unconscionably detained in jail. So non-adversarial system. The second is independence. So the most significant complaint around the country, and it's with reason, is when prosecutors would put these systems up, they would say, people would say, well, geez, this is the fox guarding the hen house. How do you expect us to trust the results coming from a prosecutor's office when they are looking at their own, right? And that's a real concern because this notion of due process in our legal system has two registers. It exists on two registers. The first is a substantive register. That's actual fairness. Things have to be fair. But the second register has to do with the appearance of fairness because sometimes when things seem unfair, appear to be unfair, a judge presiding over the case where the litigant is her brother, right? That could be the nicest person in the world, but people say, come on, that just doesn't look right, doesn't look fair. So the appearance of fairness, so you got to do something about independence. So one of the things that worked in uh, Dallas, Texas, they were sort of the, the first people to get out there on conviction review. Um, they had a system where they brought in the Innocence Project to work with them in the prosecutor's office, and their conviction integrity unit was led by a defense attorney. So that was part of the model. That was one of the things I took and said, look, you have to have someone with a defense background in charge. Because there are all sorts of institutional biases in any institution. And you need someone who doesn't have that bias such that both the system will be fair and it will appear to be fair, right? And that was satisfied in me. So I designed the system, then I implemented it. So I was the, the, the chief of that, that, that unit, right? So a guy who had been a defense attorney, um, now a law professor, taught criminal law, uh, but was very biased. I'll admit it. I, everyone has priors. My bias is on the defense side, right? So you put that in there, and this is an independent voice. But we did something else that was unique. We impaneled something called an independent review panel. These were three lawyers not paid by the district attorney's office that also reviewed the cases we reviewed. And they made an independent presentation to the district attorney about their findings, right? So the internal unit would do its. We make a recommendation, give it to the independent review panel. They would look at what we wrote. They would ask questions, have access to anything they wanted, and they would make their own decision, right? Independence. 
Third and final, and this is the most important one, uh, and it's ethos. Ethos. What, what do I mean by that? Now, this is something I learned in New Orleans. I learned that in any institution, structure alone is not sufficient. It's necessary. Got to have a good structure. But in order for that structure to actualize in its fullest, then there has to be an ethos in the office that supports that scaffolding. And the ethos was going back to first principles, that the role of the prosecutor has to be a minister of justice, not someone wanting to get convictions, but someone who is interested in justice. Now, this is not the easiest thing, because the currency in all of these offices are conviction, just like the currency in Public defender's offices are acquittals, right? So I was at PDS. Uh, some, with some, someone over here is at PDS. I ultimately became the director of the D.C. Public Defender Service, not because I was an expert in federal appropriation laws. It was a federally funded agency. Not because I had testified in Congress and sort of knew how to, how to, how to, how to negotiate with the senators for the budget. Not because I knew one thing about HR because I know how to try a case, right? And it's the same in prosecutor's offices. There is a currency in these offices, and that currency is winning. So in a prosecutor's office, the currency is getting convictions. So I said to Ken, all right, if we're going to do this, you have to promise me one thing. Every time you open your mouth publicly, addressing your entire staff, you have to say something about justice, that it is your role as prosecutors to make justice happen, to do justice, to be ministers of justice. That's the first thing. And he did that. Every speech, every global email, he would say something about being a minister of justice. Second thing, every single time that a bureau chief, department chief, sends out some congratulatory email about a conviction or big indictment, big bust, send out an email congratulating someone for dismissing a case because they found out that they had the wrong individual. You have to create the sort of currency that makes doing the right thing appreciable. And he did that. When we started this project, the prosecutors assigned to the conviction, we called it conviction review unit, we wanted to change the name, they thought they were being banished to Siberia. <laughs> By the end of my tenure there, we were getting resumes from senior prosecutors saying, can we be part of this, right? And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why, because I firmly believe that no human being, you know, I was going to say no prosecutor, but no human being just wakes up in the morning and says, geez, let me go out and put somebody in jail for 30 years who didn't do it, right? And if they do, that person ought to go to jail, right? But that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's a gross minority. There are a lot of reasons why there are innocent people in jail, but if we can appeal to the better angels, of people to actually do their job and do it well, then that is a great start. So um, we got a letter from a guy named Roger Logan. These are, these are one of the cases. This, this one stands out in my mind because uh, we created a triage, you know, like at the emergency room to look at cases that came in. And it was a function of these, uh, these cases, a fu function of the, 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 the sorts of conditions that caused error or that resulted in error. And a handwritten note from a guy named Roger Logan came in. He had been in jail at the time, 17 years, and said, I didn't do it. I was framed by the detective. Can you look at the case? Not a lot to go on, right? So we opened up the case. It's an old case 17 years ago. Nothing 
is digitized, right? So we, we, we're going through paper files, and it turns out that it is a single witness ID case. Class, what do we know about single witness ID cases, right? <laughs> Prone to error, that's right. You know, in law school, we cold call, so if I, if I just point at somebody sometimes, <laughs> forgive me, right? It is it, that these sorts of cases are prone to error, right? So we look at Logan's case, and uh, it's a single witness ID. So pops up to the top. We take a look, and pretty simple case. Witness says, um, I saw Logan fighting, arguing with some guys the night before about the results of a dice game outside. And the next day, I saw them still arguing. Logan comes, kicks in the door to an apartment, the vestibule of an apartment, and starts shooting, killing one of the victims, right? We, um, and, you know, she says, I, the way I know him is because I saw him the night before, and he lives in the community. I've seen him and so forth, right? And so that seems pretty open and shut, right? Pretty open and shut. The data tells us something different that it may not be open and shut. It may be, but we don't know. We don't know, right? Trust the data. We don't know. So we're going to look at it a little more closely. Um, I won't go through in painful detail everything that happened, but what we found was this. We went to the scene. We went to the scene, and we found two things out. One that where the witness said she was standing, the witness said she was outside, right next, she lived right next door to the shooting, that uh, Logan started shooting. She ran into her house, looked out the window, and kept, and, and he was still shooting. So far consistent. There were about 12 shots, a lot, a lot of shooting going on. And it sounded, it sounded okay. Uh, we sent some people to the scene, because that's what defense attorneys do, right? This is the internal bias. Right? You look at reports and you're a skeptic. Right? You look at reports and huh, yeah, right. Right? Even when there's no cause to say yeah, right. <laughs> you know? But that's how we're trained, and that this is how you sort of counteract institutional biases. You go to the scene and it turns out it, it was the next house, but not right next door. Right? And you know, I've said many times before, it turned out that Usain Bolt Bolt could not have gone from where she said she was into her apartment. And it happened to be on the second floor, up the stairs and to a window, and the person's still shooting, right? <laughs> Couldn't have happened. Could not have happened, right? So, um, and, uh, and, and, and this, was, this was quite a sight. We, we actually had um, a lawyer and a, a, a cop in plain clothes out there, um, uh, two uh, middle-aged uh, white guys in this overwhelmingly African-American community, one of them standing out there, saying, bang, 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 with the stopwatch, and the other one running uh, <laughs> down the street uh, to test this, right? So, um, right? Now, 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 Lucas is probably thinking there were a hundred better ways to test that, right? But I didn't know this. I hadn't been to this conference, right? This is, this is what I came up with. This is what I was able to come up with. So he's running down the street, and, um, and we go upstairs, look into the window, and you, you know, you can kind of see, but not really. Um, what did this lead us to do? This led us to investigate the witness because we just wanted to see. Make a long story short. So I told you, she said she was able to recognize Mr. Logan because she had seen them the night before arguing about a, a, a dice game. It turned out going through back 20 years in records that she was in police custody the night before. She had been arrested for something. She, she wasn't there. She wasn't there uh, the night before. We tracked some things down. Again, 20 years of old dusty records going to different divisions. And it turned out uh, she wasn't released until the evening of the shooting. So she was, pro she was in all likelihood in court, uh, night court, when the shooting was happening. Right. So she wasn't even there. So what looked like an open and shut case um, uh, was not. Right. And um, Mr. Logan was um, 
released after spending 17 and a half years in prison for a crime that he um, did not commit. Uh, the, um, the most difficult case of my tenure at Brooklyn uh, w regards a man named uh, David McCallum. And um, October was the anniversary of his, his release. I still get, get choked up about it. He was 15 when he was arrested and spent 30 years in prison uh, for a crime he didn't commit. Um, and, um, and David's doing well now. He, um, he, he works for an innocence project in New York. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he found, he's found the, the love of his life, and they have a new little baby, uh, or, you know, year old, I guess now. Uh, but um, uh, David w and his friend, uh, both 15, were arrested, uh, and uh, his friend died in prison. Uh, he was 34, and we vacated his conviction posthumously. His mother sat at council table sobbing um, because she had maintained all along that her son and David were out playing handball in the projects in Brooklyn at the time of this, this murder. Uh, the, uh, the people who were in all likelihood responsible were um, some about 10 years older, uh, both David and, uh, and Mr. Stuckey is the gentleman who died in prison, were um, about five, six, five, seven, uh, short cut hair. The perpetrator was probably six, one uh, in his 20s, uh, and the other guy was uh, my height, five, five, eleven or so. Um, and again, much, much uh, older, and evidence was uh, not turned over uh, timely to defense counsel. Um, so, Imagine if I had been someplace like here uh, prior to taking on this task at Brooklyn. Um, we would go by hand, the lawyers, uh, through the hundreds and hundreds of cases that came in and try to figure out which ones were prone to error, because otherwise it would just be an impossible task, and punch those to the top. But what if someone could put those into a scanner, code the cases, and spit out a list. You know, these are the ones that you ought to, that, that you ought to look at. But how about this? What if every prosecutor's office coded cases when they came in? <laughs> and you say, well, for these sorts of cases, we have to take special care. Because we know that these are the sorts of cases that are prone to error. Make, make my work irrelevant. Because you're catching it at the, the front end, right? You get a warning sign, essentially. Whoa, this is a single witness cross-racial cross identification case. It's got this factor. It's got that factor. It's got a third factor. Well, let's look for additional corroborative evidence before before we indict this case, right? right? So this is the, let, let's take care. Let, let's take care. In, 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 in one of the cases, I always tell people, it, didn't, it didn't, doesn't take a Harvard lawyer to figure this out. This, this, this was a guy in prison 19 years. Um, he was at Disney World when the shooting happened in Brooklyn. There's a, there was a receipt in his back pocket when he got arrested and it sat in the file for almost 20 years. Nobody had looked at it, right? Single witness ID case. That's why we looked at it. And, you know, I'd like to say, well, you know, brilliant legal analysis. Blah, blah. No, I just, I can read, yeah. right? <laughs> I can read. I looked at the file, and we found the receipt. And like, huh, wow, this guy was in, in, in Florida, right? But had people early on said, Bing, bing, bing. This is a case, oh, you know, one of these factors hit. This is a case we ought to take a look at. Maybe someone would have just read the whole file and not just uh, put this guy uh, in jail. Here's the lesson that I have learned 
and one that I want to leave each of you with. Um, so I take myself to be in the justice business. And one of the essential characters of justice, at least that I've recognized over the years, is that justice is not some magic thing that just happens. Justice is not something that falls out from the sky. Hi, I'm justice. <laughs> I'm here. Right? Justice is something that you and you and you, 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 me, justice is something that individuals make happen. This is a decidedly pragmatic notion of justice, that justice is not some rarefied abstraction with no or little practical application. Justice is something that we do, that we act, that we remain ever vigilant to ensure that the constitutional rights and liberties of everyone extends to all people, indigent people, people of color, people of ethnic and religious minorities. Justice is something that we make happen. When we do justice, we work to convert a problematic legal landscape into a beautiful courtyard of justice. When we do justice, we refuse to let the anesthetizing security of a good job lull us into a dangerous do-nothingness. We get out and act. When we do justice, we roll up our sleeves and lend a helping hand to the low, the last, the least, the lost, and the left out among us. When we do justice, we refuse to let the excuse of inadequate resources prevent us from delivering a high quality of justice. When we do justice, we never let the quality of someone's representation be dependent on the size of their checkbook. And that's for each and every one of us uh, to do. And whatever field you're in, when you see an injustice, you do it. The organizers of this event, for example, they're busy, right? They could have been doing any number of other things as graduate students, as young professionals, right? But to take time and effort and their particular skill set to say, we are going to intervene with what we know and do and give this arena a powerful tool in order to do justice, they ought to be applauded. They ought to be applauded. So I'm going to close here and just ask everyone, when you go home, let's go and do a little justice today. Thank you very much. I got the. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so, Thank much. You so much. Thank Thanks you. For everything you do. <laughs> wow, thank you all. I want to give another round of applause for P Professor Ron Sullivan. Thank you for closing out the very first Data for Black Lives conference with such a strong call to action. You know, in the opening remarks, I talked about how I couldn't imagine the response that we would get 
when we released the registration link. And I don't think I could have this ever imagined just how powerful and how moving this space has been for me personally, for my family who is here, <laughs> for my friends, and for all of you, my new friends and family. And in the process, we have so many people to thank. So many to thank, and I'll let Lucas yeah. start off with the list. <laughs> Bear with me here. So, I, of course, we're extremely grateful to all of our sponsors for providing the resources to make this happen. Um, but I actually want to take a moment to thank the human beings uh, behind this convening. Um, firstly, Megan Westcott and MIT Conference Services. I, I know we haven't always been the easiest client, um, and there are a lot of moving pieces, but you pulled it off uh, seamlessly, and thank you so much for being patient with us and, and bringing this amazing idea to uh, fruition. So thank you again. I want to give a special thank you to Phyllis, our stage manager, and the whole team at Studio 125. This may have looked smooth, but the behind the scenes, there were a lot of last minute changes and adjustments, and um, they just did an amazing job. Uh, Rita's catering, yeah. food is important. <laughs> and I never knew there were so many different types of tater tots. <laughs> I want to thank our volunteers, particularly, we had like 30 volunteers, an outpouring of support from MIT, Boston, and actually not just Boston, we had people from as far as Evansville, Indiana, so thank you very much. Yes. Um, particularly, particularly uh, Hannah and Nana are volunteer captains. And Jerrica Copany, yes. hailing from Evansville, Indiana, a, a, civic a civic data scientist working out of the Evansville Public Library System, transforming on a daily basis the way that data functions in public life. So thank you very much. Yes. Um, within MIT, I want to thank uh, Paul Paravano. I mean, there are a lot of people to thank, but Paul Paravano stands out. Conference convenings like this within institutions like MIT do not just spring into existence. Um, the committed support of individuals with influence is, is necessary. And Paul has repeatedly gone out on a limb for us. He has taken this cause to President Reif, to uh, dis various decision makers within MIT. So thank you so much, Paul. Um, this one almost goes without explanation. I want to thank Dom Jones, who produced the concert last night. She pulled this off in record time with very little guidance from us. Um, so thank you again, Dom. I think she's here. So thank her personally if you see her for putting on uh, what was, I think, an essential, an essential component of this conference. Oops. One moment. I also I want to thank uh, Professor Ruha Benjamin. Yeah. Of course, of course, all of our speakers deserve uh, thanks for their insights and their brilliance, but. I think Professor Benjamin um, set a tone. Yes. Yes. She set a tone for the whole conference. Tone. And, <clears throat> and, and that's, that's invaluable. Um, I could go on and on, but I, I actually, I think most importantly, I want to thank all of you because the, the success or failure of convenings like this depends crucially on the people who are in the room. Um, and I don't know about you, but I would call this a success. Yeah. And so the thanks goes to you for bringing your brilliance and your insights and your, your whole selves uh, to this space. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Yeshi, who's going to talk about what's next. What is next? Great. Thanks, Lucas. You know, we call this the inaugural Data for Black Lives Conference with the hope of having it every year. But I'm gonna be transparent and say we, we weren't sure, right? Right, we were, you know, the scientists in us, we said, let's test it out. Let's see what we get. And the results have been tremendous, have been phenomenal. 
And I think I can announce that officially next year we will be having another Data for Black Lives conference. Yes. <laughs> great, great. But that means something for all of you, right? We have a survey, and one of the options in the survey is do you want to be a part of the planning committee? Yeah. Right. We want you to be involved from the very beginning so that we can welcome even more people, even more speakers. All the folks on live stream, we love you, but we want you here in the room next year with us because this has been a phenomenal space just to be present and to be physically here in. So. Another thing um, that we're gonna be doing and working on is um, in the opening panel, Latanya Wallace from Virginia Civic Engagement Table brought up a really good idea. How do we take some of the amazing ideas, especially some of the skills that our data scientists brought at our Ask a Data Scientist booth, some of the examples of the ways in which organizers are using data across the country to build real political power for black people, to make real concrete and measurable change for black people, and how do we train other folks up in that? So we will be working on a toolkit that we will be testing out in Virginia, and we will be using um, to hopefully train folks all over the country. And, and we want everybody to be involved in that process as well. We do. And as I, and I mentioned before that, you know, we want to focus on really building out our network. And I, I said this before, I'm a, I'm a product of leadership development, and I believe in leadership development. And I believe in investing in people's leadership and their capacity. And I think that's one of the things that we want to focus on. How do we invest in all of your leadership? And how do we invest in the leadership of people who aren't here who may never even come to MIT Media Lab, right? So if you're interested in thinking about this toolkit and contributing to it and thinking about other iterations of ways that we can bring some of this information to folks, please go to the registration desk and, and give your name and your email. Caroline from MIT Conference Services will be taking that information and we're gonna loop you into this. And you know, that's the, one of the official next steps, but there's a lot of unofficial collaborations and connections and things that have organically kind of grown out of this conference and we want to uplift those as well right so one of the things that we're going to do is making sure that you know we have folks report back to us about some of the things that are that have come out of this and we're going to do the work of identifying that so that we can share it with you all right because at the very least and most importantly we want to share examples of how people are winning how people are using data in a way that's different right to make real change for people. As I said before, I got into working with data out of necessity because young people in my school were being beaten across the head with the police baton. People in my community were dying and that's why I started to use data. And I think um, there's so many examples of ways that people are powerfully doing that, whether it's simple statistics or machine learning algorithms, right? So that's another thing that we wanna do. And again, don't forget, fill out the survey Give us your feedback on your experience here. Help us make it better for next year. And if you have the time and capacity, be involved with the planning process. We're getting started planning right away. So, thank you. All right, great. So we have, we have about six minutes for a, a little bit of an interactive exercise. And I think I spent uh, most of my time for the people I connected with asking the question, what brought you here, and how did you find out about this? Um, and now, uh, I think some of the things I'm interested in hearing from you, and Sky, where's Sky? My helper, my vo super volunteer with the mic. Back there. All right, so Sky has a mic, and um, I'd love for people to just speak out and tell us a little bit about what you took away from this, what are the ways you're going to take this back to your respective spaces, and what gives you hope about what we're going to build with you? And so that's open. And raise your hand if you're interested in sharing out. Um, over here, Sky. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, we only have one mic. Just got Give it up one for our mic. volunteers. Give it up to the volunteers, hustling. Do we got a mic? We got a mic. That's my sister, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay, so in one of our previous discussions, I did have a comment. Um, 
So I'm about to get into that right now. I'm not such a well public speaker, so I did have to write some things down. So yeah, in in regards to the, uh, you know, trying to be prosperous in the African American community or African community in general, I feel like we did touch based on two topics here, which is Afrofuturism and Pan-Africanism. As far as the Afrofuturism, in the commencement, we, you know, we were the original polymaths and technology began within our civilization or quote, civilizations or quote unquote civilization and even before civilization. With that being said, history is just repeating itself. We are going through a major shift right now, reverting back to majorly utilizing such high power and consciousness that we hold as individuals. And just to add a little point here, uh, in regards to the term future, this does not exclude the past nor present. They all work hand in hand. And you can't have one without the other. Okay. So time is a concept. So the only thing that defines time is change. And we are the change. Amen. Oh. Now, Pan-Africanism, and I, and I really wanted to get into this because I do want people to look into this more. Uh, for instance, we want to build and support black businesses to get, you know, that exponential growth flowing into and through Africa, which is our motherland, a predominantly black region, cycling back and forth and eventually into black communities globally. And although we haven't received this, to me, this is a form of reparations and liberation. And we are the majority. Yes, oh, great. Right. We got to bring my right right behind to the speaker. Let's pass it. Go right here. Um, so I really appreciated the talk with um, the president of the United Bank, particularly because I am really for outreach, which I'm, I'm not sure why that sound is happening, um, which I'm sure a lot of us are. And I run into so many, like literally I work, I run workshops, I have friends, and I just did not understand how someone could get denied for a checkings account. I don't, it just seemed weird to me. I was just like, well, is it because of the credit score? It didn't make sense, like even when their credit score was improving. And knowledge is incredibly powerful because I had no idea it was just because of this whatever blacklist thing is happening that are like preventing people from opening accounts even when they do better later. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting to find out. But also um, when I can't, oh wait. I cannot remember her name. She was sitting right there and she was talking about mentorship and how you have to pick mentors who are worth your time, basically. Mm -hmm. And I will say that I've had a lot of people who, one, you know, I'm trying to help them, but they're obviously not trying to help themselves. Mm -hmm. And you have to wait till someone has their time, like when they're ready. You can't force anyone into it. But also, like the fact that some people, I feel like they take, 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 and they don't give back. Those are the people that I feel like I should be investing in less. And it hadn't occurred to me until she said that. And I was just like, ah. Oh. I got to kick off a couple of my mentees, or you know, like, <laughs> right. and it was good, yeah. Thank you for some, someone, someone told me once there are mentors and tormentors. <laughs> All right, uh, Sky, how about right, right there? Hi, how are you guys doing? And assalamu alaikum. I'm Latifa, and I'm Muslim. Um, this was really exciting for me just from cont a contextual uh, space because so many things are popping through my head. I do, I play right. And so there were just so many scenes, so many possibilities, so many real things happening in this space. Um, one of the things from my own cultural experience is there's a, 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 there's a, a, a written a statement in the Quran that says, um, there'll be a period of time in which the baby girl asks, for what crime have I been buried? Yeah. And when I first heard Yeshi's talk about the police officer that slammed the girl's head down, it made me relive a part of my own teenage experience where I witnessed the same act. And to think, I hate to say about 20 years between us, right? <laughs> I was like, this has been happening for a long time and it is totally unacceptable. But in hearing all of your voices, I thought about that baby girl because 
A girl is symbolic of society. That's what girl is, right? A baby is symbolic of a burgeoning society, right? So for all of us to be so discontent with the level of spaces that we've inherited from our transport from the other continent to here, and to be able to ask that question so boldly, so scientifically, and so prepared to respond, it is prophetic. So that's where I got from this event. I was so excited to see the millennials particularly excited about the Black Panthers, right? (laughs) (laughs) But I was also a little dismayed coming here because I posted this on Facebook. Why weren't so many people excited about Marshall that just came out the other day? He was a real life tangible hero. We're talking about the intangible we can relate to more than our reality of our own self image as a people. And that draws both a problem and a solution. It offers the idea that culture can make anything possible if we can dream it. But it also makes us think back, why do we have to reflect on Disney's version of our self image in order to be empowered? Right. And that's what I got from we'll, this. We'll take, we'll take, Sky, let's go here. I want to try to get two more from the room and then we, oh, we have to cut. And then we encourage you to continue sharing out as you transition out and stream out of this place. Uh, right here. No? And then we'll close with that. I just want to share a story from the first person I met here, Charles Irwin, who works in Jackson, Mississippi, as a partly as uh, on defense. I work in criminal justice reform, and uh, when I said, uh, "Oh, you're in Mississippi. Have you heard of this bill, HB 585?" We took uh, Mississippi's criminal justice data and analyzed it in my organization, found the reasons for some of the injustice that was happening there, helped write and pass a bill to try and change some of that. And he told me that he uses HB 585 to help his clients. And uh, just the fact that the data that we use and what we did to connect to a real person on the ground in Mississippi who uses it to change people's lives there, that's sort of like, for me, the theme of this whole conference was data scientists meeting people on the ground. Our data analysis is helping real people. And having those stories it's really helped me a lot and will continue to inspire me in my work. What a great way to close. All right, thank you, everyone.